Right. So welcome, um, everybody. Welcome to the King's Maritime History Seminars, the, organized by the British Commission uh, for Maritime History. Uh, it's a series of uh, seminars organized uh, with the support of the Society for Nautical Research uh, and uh, Lloyd's Register, and it's uh, a series hosted by the Lawton uh, Naval History Unit uh, in the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War uh, in the Department of War Studies and King's College London. Uh, so there are many welcomes uh, offered to you all, and of course to our speaker, and I'm very pleased to be able uh, to uh, present Captain Rodney Brown, who comes to us with a lot of um, practical uh, experience of the, of the sea itself, um, a lot of professional experience uh, with a career of, uh, of many years uh, with the, the maritime uh, sector of Shell, uh, but also academic experience um, as uh, naturally an historian uh, and an historian uh, for the Shipwrights and Ivory Company um, and uh, Rodney is a member uh, of the Wellington Trust, as we were just discussing uh, a moment ago, um, the Honourable Company of Master Mariners and uh, a number of others. Um, so we're a very good company uh, and we are, uh, Rodney, very grateful that you came uh, to speak uh, to the BCMH uh, seminars uh, for us. Um, I'll just say uh, in the Last week, we allowed people to turn on their cameras if they want, if they want to be part of a gallery, so we would feel like we're more, um, a bit of a, uh, at, an, at an event, uh, that's been suggested to us as, a, as, a, as an option. And as for questions, we'll do as we have done uh, in recent, um, 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 recent seminars. Uh, I will ask you to raise your electronic hand at the end, and I'll invite you uh, to, you know, to, 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 to unmute yourselves and to, and to ask your questions directly, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll monitor that. So I don't think there's any further ado. Uh, so with that, I will hand over to you, uh, Ron, with, uh, with our thanks. Are we all ready in that case? We are all ready to go, so. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be before you. Uh, initially, I would say that the uh, slideshow that I present to you was made in conjunction with the Royal Naval Museum at Portsmouth. Uh, initially, we used to show it together, but decided that rather than travel long distances, we would show it individually, giving credit to the opposite side. So the military side, particularly the aviation side on the uh, uh, what was then called the fleet air arm, we owe to the Royal Naval uh, Museum in, in Portsmouth. So North Atlantic air cover for convoys in World War II. Uh, no. The convoys we are about to talk about are the ordinary convoys, i.e. cargo ships and tankers for the day-to-day -day requirements of the United Kingdom, not for troop ships and for specialized uh, cargoes. They were much more enhanced than these were. So off we go with the routine convoys. The Battle of the Atlantic. 3rd of June 1939 to the 8th of May 1945. British Isles required a million tons of material per week. Germany and Italy were intent on preventing Britain receiving this material. And there's no doubt about it, the winner would win the war. Winston Churchill's speech I read it for you. The Battle of Atlantic was dominating factor all through the war. Never for one moment could we forget that everything happened elsewhere on land, at sea, or in the air depended ultimately on its outcome. The enemy had the pocket battleship, the U boat, and long range aeroplanes. There we have 
the Untersee Boop. No, we call them subs in the UK. We have this strange factor of initialing things. We call it the U-boat, but you can see why it's the U-boat, but the Germans gave it its full name, Untersee Boot. Buchwolf Condor 200 was initially a pre-war airliner but modified and used for reconnaissance directing U-boat groups towards convoys. It had a long range because pre-war, before it was converted to what it's doing there, it flew from Germany all the way to New York. And by not carrying the passengers, but carrying inspection crews, it had a lightweight capacity to go into the uh, mid-Atlantic for quite a long period of time to try and detect convoys. Here are the two German airplanes that were long range or could get at least to mid-Atlantic and back to attack our ships. No, Junker Ju-88 Madchen für alles. The German translation of that is mud for all. But it so happens that I visited some time ago the RAF Museum at Duxford and was talking to the pilot of our Lancaster bomber. And he was saying, when you go into the air on this aeroplane, the wings wobble. And therefore, you have to hold the joystick all the time and you have to fly this aeroplane full time. There's no such thing as automatic. That's what he means when he says matching for allies. That aeroplane was difficult to fly. Here is the situation. The only air cover that we could get is within the black lines. The convoys used to gather in New Jersey and in New York Harbor. And when I say gather, they used to gather approximately 30 to 40 ships before they would go on their convoy voyage. That would take them three to four weeks to gather. So a convoy had to leave once per week at least so one from New Jersey, one from New York, one from, and that's the way they did it. So you will see a bit later on, there were some nice uh, factors about that. The uh, green dashes indicate the routes. You can see the routes that we went, tended to swing northwards. Of course, convoys were also coming up from the south around the Cape of Good Hope, which had the same thing, but we're dealing with the uh, North Atlantic ones now. The blue dots, which look almost numerous, were ships destroyed by the end of 1943, and the red dots were the sunken U boats, not so many. The mid Atlantic gap was known as the Black Hole. And boy, for people who went through it, it was a black hole. The Allied defense system the convoy, destroyer and frigate protection, the escort aircraft carriers, Aztec, which is uh, ping pong and finding things underneath the world, the Enigma, those who know it for uh, the breaking of the code, that we had broken the code to understand what was being sent in German. And we had eventually some long range airplanes, well, mostly flying boats. The first merchant aircraft carrier was a merchant ship converted into an aircraft carrier. The reason for that was that uh, to put a regular Royal Naval aircraft carrier into a convoy meant that it was the prime target for the U-boat. So we wanted to get away from using our prime aircraft carriers for convoy duty, and therefore we had these converted merchant ships. 
The initial one went to the United States, uh, to the uh, Royal Navy, built in the United States, and therefore that's why we call them, or the Royal Navy called them, the Woolworth Carrier. This was HMS Searcher, uh, another Royal Naval Aircraft Carrier with 25 aircraft. And once, as you will see later, the merchant ship, merchant aircraft carriers came along, the two Royal Navy ones went off to do specialized convoys such as escorting troop ships and armored ships and that kind of thing. Initially, we had the come. 26 merchant ships were fitted with a catapult and an RAF hurricane fighter zoomed off. Uh, nine combat missions, eight aircraft and one pilot loss. But they did shoot down German airplanes and one was damaged. The problem was that if one of the hurricane pilots had taken off, the only place he could land his aeroplane was on dry land. And when he got, if he got into a uh, battle with the enemy, he wasn't particularly looking at his watch. And there were quite a number of them had to land in the sea. Fortunately, landing near a ship where rescue operations were taking place and most were picked up. So we didn't have too many pilots lost, but we had a few aircraft lost. Then came the merchant aircraft carriers. Here with are the cargo ships that were converted. The normal deck of the cargo ship is where that black deck second down is. That's the normal deck and they built above it the hangar for the four aeroplanes and then the accommodation for the extra people that they had on board. The grey area in the middle is the engine room of the ship. And of course, there's a propeller shaft going through. Now, the merchant aircraft carriers also carried the cargo that they were there for. So when they came across the Atlantic, they normally carried the dry cargo ships. They normally carried grain in, in bulk. Uh, but not always, but that was the easy cargo to carry and the necessary one for us to receive over here. Here is the tanker. Now, there was a bit of resistance at the beginning for tankers. The argument was, how are we going to put the aeroplanes, the aviation fuel and the engines of the aeroplanes near an oil cargo, some of which might be gasoline or diesel or things of that kind. So there was persuasion, uh, arm twisting, and eventually HMG agreed, and we converted a number of oil tankers into merchant aircraft carriers. The engine room, of course, is aft. The uh, deck is just above where it says oil cargo. Uh, the aviation fuel space, which is gasoline, uh, is in the middle there. And uh, the accommodation, which was a normal accommodation on the ship, is either there, the cruise accommodation down here aft. And we built this little thing up here called the bridge above the flight deck. But there was one problem. We could hardly make a hangar in the middle of the oil. And therefore, we had to keep our airplanes on deck all the time. So when airplanes were landing on, we pushed the parked ones up to the front. And when they were taking off, we pushed them to the back. And there is one of the shell ships before it was converted. MV Alexia, built in 1935. Its speed used to be 12 knots, which is about 13 and a half miles per hour. So the difficulty of taking an aeroplane off from a ship going at that speed wasn't as easy as the RN ones that I showed you earlier. Here is the conversion taking place. You see, this is the normal walkway, the uh, 
the gangway up the deck. You see the lifeboats here, ready to bail out if necessary, and the flight deck built on top at the height above it. And here is it, the flight deck of the Alexio when she was being converted. The operators of the MAX, uh, the cargo ships Hainlein and Benline, uh, and uh, BP and Shell, or it was called anglo saxon in those days, uh, we built them. Now, at the time, HMG was the effective owner of ships. They decided what they had to do, how they were converted and whatever. The owners of the ship, the true owners of the ship, were no more than the operators doing as they were told. And the government said, well, we want to call all the ships Empire something. And Shell said, to change a ship's name is unlucky. We refused to change ours. So apart from one ship, which was a new one, they all retained their own names. When the Germans started to move into Holland, the Dutch shell fleet brought four of its ships and its manpower and some of its naval staff over to the UK and they joined in. Two of the ships were transferred to the British flag with British staff, but two, Miralda and Godilla, remained Dutch. Blew the Dutch ensign, and with Dutch staff, with Dutch aircrew, and they stayed well, welded in, of course, and everyone worked together. But nevertheless, the Dutch did a good job by joining in where they could. The advantages of the Max easy conversion, relatively easy. But look at the cost of ships, it's unbelievable, isn't it? The cost of a normal tanker. Only two hundred and thirty-two thousand pounds, and the cost of a Mark three hundred and thirty-one thousand pounds. At the moment, you have to pay about five or six millions for them. The Max always carried their cargo, grain or oil, and the tanker Max were rigged so that they could refuel at sea their escort uh, ships, the destroyers and the frigates. Its advantage. They only did 12 knots, so it was a bit difficult for uh, aircraft to take off and land. We'll come to that a bit later. The flight deck length of a cargo ship was uh, 461, the cargo ship 413, the tank of 461, and only 62 foot wide. This meant that the aeroplanes had to be uh, an easy lift-off aeroplane, which made the swordfish, couldn't be a hurricane or a uh, spitfire. It had to have rockets instead of its normal carriage of torpedoes and depth charges. And it had no hangar below the deck, uh, for reasons I've mentioned. There it is, there's the swordfish on the tanker about to take off. Notice under the lower wings, the rockets, the four on each wing, and notice the uh, parked aeroplanes ready for takeoff. The part ones are at the back of the ship. But I want you to particularly notice the uh, trip wire going across underneath the aeroplane and the little piece of metal sticking out below in order to catch the trip. They lowered it to catch the trip when landing. Not always easy to take off. <laughs> and certainly not always easy to maintain. When this situation came about, we were a little bit concerned about how will the civilian merchant Navy people get along with the Royal Naval people? Because we certainly have different systems, different standards and whatever. But as it turned out, it all went well, no difficulties whatsoever. And the only, the captain of the ship was in charge by law, 
And the only person he had to take notice of was the Commodore of the convoy. However, he didn't have the, he had the sense to take notice of what the military said when we were talking about military operations. They were reasonably heavily armed, the Max, four inch gun, two single bofers, and six single Ehrlichans. Now this meant that in addition to the fleet air arm, pilots and air crew and engineers that were on board, there were also people from various pieces of military. They didn't particularly pick naval staff to fire these guns. They might come from the army or the Royal Marines or whatever. So there was a, a mixture of, of people on board. Notice 52 merchant Navy people, 50 milit uh, uh, naval military staff, 100 people on board. Compared to the uh, Woolworths aircraft carriers, which had 600 people on board. And now you've got a classic case of the difference between how you run a warship and how you run a merchant ship. But since in the law, everybody on board had to be recruited as a crew member and had to be paid. We paid the Royal Navy people and the military a shilling a day. How about that? Most of the uh, Max were on board until the war ended. The Lee's London ships from the USA were returned, if still operating, whilst HMS Searcher class and others were returned to the United States Navy, but eventually became uh, merchant ships. The long range aeroplanes, well, the short Sunderland, the Liberator, the US uh, made aeroplane, and the Catalina. They had sufficient engine power to get into the black hole. And they were the airplanes, they carried uh, torpedoes and bombs and mines, and they were the ones that destroyed most submarines. The Mach ships, their prime aim was to shoot down the Condor airplane, which is what they did. When you shot down the Condor airplane, the Germans had made a major mistake by Admiral Donitz sending his submarine in packs rather than individually. The Condor guided them to the location it had found the convoy. Because of the Enigma being able to uh, register what the enemy was saying, this gave the uh, Navy and other forces knowledge of where the submarines were likely to be, so they are uh, able to attack them on the surface. The convoy uh, deviated once it had found the convo convoy airplane and shot it down, which is what they did with those four rockets under the wings, deviated. So, the war was won by the Max, but amazingly, the prime win was a major mistake by Admiral Donitz, who had decided to hunt in packs guided by the Condor aeroplane. There's the thing, the German blockade failed, so the Allies won the war. Merchant ships lost 3,500. Now that's for the entire uh, Germanic war. Allied warships lost 175. German U-boats lost 783. And there we are, 72,200 merchant navy and allied naval mariners lost, and a 30,000 German U-boat men lost. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my show. And any questions, fire away, please. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wonder, well, uh, well, people are, 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 are gathering their thoughts. I wonder if you could say something about the, um, 
uh, the Azores. Whenever I, whenever I think about the, uh, you know, the, the Mid Atlantic uh, air, air gap, I think about the uh, Azores, and I'm not, I'm not so clear, clear on, um, you know, um, the um, competition for control. And I know, I know that it, it, it helped to close the gap. Um, but I wonder if you could say something about you know, the German uh, position on it, or, or, or something um, along those lines. Well. Uh, certainly, there was uh, a large number of ships coming around from the Far East. There was fairly important cargoes to be received from India and Australia. Uh, however, there was no attacking point for the enemy, provided they kept fairly well south all the way around until they arrived roughly at where the Gibraltar Straits are. And therefore, the convoy duty going into the United Kingdom from the Gibraltar states was the same as the uh, North Atlantic convoy system. Uh, the only difficulty was that gathering the convoy couldn't have been, uh, it wasn't easier because you didn't come round in convoy where it was peaceful. You had to collect and wait off the Gibraltar Straits. The advantage of that route was that uh, it was out of range of German air aircraft. Germany did not conquer Spain, and therefore, until you got within uh, airplane range of France, then uh, you, you were free and clear. So it was that latter part where there was an element of defense from the Air Force of the United Kingdom against aeroplanes from the uh, German U-boat effort primarily concentrated in the North Atlantic. The other area where U-boat uh, operation was very serious was within the Mediterranean. And the, of course, most of it was operated by the Italian uh, regime there. Uh, and it was ultra serious if you had to take cargo through to Malta, which we managed to retain Malta. And Malta was a prime example of how we managed to continue winning the war. Very good. Okay. Um, and as I say, I mean, uh, uh, you know, people um, attendees, you can uh, raise your. Uh, Hands if you have any uh, any questions. So there's uh, Jim Jim Dingerman. If you if you want to, you, you, you're you're welcome to unmute yourself uh, and even turn on your mic if you like to ask uh, ask a question. Sorry, I haven't heard a question. No, I haven't heard it either. We might be uh, maybe I need to allow him to talk. Yes, um, yes, there, there it is. Well. All right, thank you, Rodney. Uh, Rodney, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, in retrospect, what do you see as the decisive mistakes that the German Navy made in waging its war against shipping in the Battle of the Atlantic? And the reason I ask is that when you look at the uh, post-war situation, for example, the Soviet Navy, they, of course, developed a very robust submarine force, obviously, with the lessons learned from World War II. That is that uh, the Germans begin the war with an inadequate number of submarines in order to really wage an aggressive strategic offensive into the Atlantic. And I'm just wondering, what do you see in retrospect are the key uh, issues that affected the Germans in not being able to do what they wanted to do? Well, uh, they, they, uh, much of uh, the reliability of maintaining ourselves in, the, in Great Britain was down to not only the United States, but the whole of the Americas, Canada and the United States, but also South America. So the collection, the cargoes from there, not only were the necessary uh, foods and etc. But bringing across American equipment for the Americans to fight with. Now the Americans of course came over themselves, but 
the, the tremendous amount of effort needed to bring the uh, United States into the Second World War concentrated on the North Atlantic. But the Germans realized this and therefore made their prime attack on that area. And that's why uh, that was the, 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 the concentration of the Battle of the Atlantic. But, uh, and they were probably correct. Uh, as I mentioned, that there wasn't much opportunity for them to attack convoys coming round from the south or formulating convoys off the Gibraltar Straits and going in. It was the prime area of attack. Now, what they did was they, they built the two big U-boat pens, one in France and the other in Norway, and they made the error of blocking all the U-boats together in one pack. And we broke the code of finding out where those U-boats were, and we could attack the U-boats, which was successful. That, that was a mistake by the Germans, was going on block rather than allowing the U-boats to go off on their own to find their own words. And then, in fact, uh, Admiral Donitz uh, admitted that after the war. Um, first of all, can I thank Graham uh, White yeah, for the Invasion of the Azores suggestion, the book, uh, where I can get to all my answers about I want about, about the Azores. Rodney, can I ask you while uh, we're waiting for others um, to gather their thoughts? Um, if, if I may say so, I mean, what you what you present is very all very positive. Um, you know, everything everything worked, uh, everybody cooperated, uh, and it all worked. And we know it did work, right? Uh, we know who won the war, we know who won the uh, Battle of the Atlantic. I just wonder if uh, you could explore maybe some of the costs involved in um, in these uh, 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 in, in these in these maps, you know, converting converting merchant ships to carriers seems to me to be, you know, as somebody who doesn't really know, uh, very much second best. You know, you say you don't want to use your 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 proper aircraft carriers because they become, you know, they're too much of a target. So you use these instead. Then surely, um, a they must have remained a target just as much as as a, as a regular aircraft carrier uh, would have done. And B, it must have come at some at some cost. So I just wonder if you could if you could give a sense of uh, a, a, a clear sense of of of, of maybe the the, the, the not the risks, uh, but the the, the the limitations and the dangers maybe uh, of using these things. Well, I I really uh, I I I myself happen to be involved in a war, the Saigon War, where Britain wasn't involved, but I happen to be uh, carrying cargo up to Saigon. Uh, and uh, of course the Americans were fighting there. And uh, it was a strange war because uh, ahead of us was an American gunboat and behind an American gunboat, which were attacked. The, the river at Saigon is very shallow, it's a marshland area with moss on either side and coming through with bullets at the American gunboats and then they stopped when we went past. And we thought, well, we must be supplying fuel for both sides. <laughs> that uh, it's it's very difficult to say that. Uh, uh, it, it it is it is difficult to say what the outcome of any world war is or any war of any kind. They're always very different, and the logic of the people deciding to wage them are not very uh, easy to follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You remind me to say one thing, mind you. Uh, the, the, the Germans are nice people. They have one item which causes the problem. They do as they're told. They really are dedicated as doing as they're told. And because of the uh, the problems in 1932 about economy and the fascists got in line there and became the Germans did as they were told according to the fascists. But the Germans themselves, Admiral Donitz issued an order to all his ships. If there is no risk to your personnel, 
and there is no risk to your ship, you have to rescue the people whose ship you have sunk and treat them cordially. No, it so happens that the Shell Company had a ship called the Sarnia that was sunk by uh, the Graf Spey battleship. And they were rescued by the Graf Spey and treated very, very cordially on board. But then they were handed over as prisoners of war to the Gestapo. And the Gestapo is a different game altogether. And that is where the fascist regime comes in. So the gentleman who went through this experience was the radio officer of the ship called the Sarnia. And he recorded everything that happened to him. And uh, that recording is in the British Museum and tells you uh, of a working great difference between uh, the Gestapo and the ordinary German. The German, unfortunately, always do as they're told. Maybe we should do that in England occasionally. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I guess um, that's it. That's uh, interesting. I, I, I guess you know I, I was interested maybe in in um, uh, more of the, the the limitations, you know, the actual practical uh, limitations, and and uh, and you know and how and how that was um, perceived um, by these these converted uh, carriers. But that's um, that's grand. There's a question uh, in the Q and A box, which I'm sure that you can you can see uh, with a little red number one. Can I invite you, Rodney, to uh, uh, open that and to and to and to read it uh, and respond to it you know, yourself? Um, Sorry, I missed um, something. From Kevin, from Kevin Stahl, or if Kevin is still there, indeed, maybe he'd like to um, ask the question directly. That might be easier. Kevin, if you're if you're still there, I, I will allow you to talk. Yes, there we are. Yeah. There. Can you? Uh, yes, I was just wondering why they, uh, the the uh, freighters who carried the catapult planes didn't use seaplanes like the uh, American Navy did pre World War Two. Well, the seaplanes were used. The, uh, the three that I showed you were the prime airplanes used, one of which is an American one. Uh, right. But uh, the, uh, the range of them extended from about 1941, 42 onwards. But there weren't that many. And uh, the difficulty was that uh, they had to be told where they were going. They, 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 didn't have advanced uh, methods of finding out where the enemy was. And that was primarily done by the, uh, the, the detection of the messages, the fact that we had broken their code so that the message sent from the Condor airplane to the Germans was picked up by uh, the uh, code breakers and therefore we knew where the enemy submarines were. Now, if you know where ships are, you can send out uh, airplanes. Uh, the uh, Catalina uh, flying boat, that was a very valuable airplane. That did quite a, a lot of uh, attacking systems. Sunderland, on the other hand, was mainly a mine laying type of uh, airplane. Variation in um, Airplanes. I helped restore one of those uh, for a local uh, aviation museum in Alaska. But no, I meant the uh, the catapult launched uh, planes that were kept on the decks, on the rails of uh, the freighters that you talked about. You showed a picture of them, the ones that had to fly the land had to fly to land on land. Uh, well, I think there was nine and eight were lost and one pilot killed. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, and in fact, I, when we, sorry, when we, uh, when I asked you to take a look at the uh, trip wire and the uh, catching hooks, uplifted a little bit at a time, 
plus the parking upon the tanker marks, the only accident that occurred was that uh, the last of the three airplanes to land on the Meralda, it was, uh, two of the airplanes were parked up on the bow and the landing airplane failed to pick up the tripwire and therefore couldn't stop and smashed into the two airplanes on the bow of the ship and they all went over the bow, all three airplanes, and of course the pilot and the navigator or the gunman navigator, they, they were both killed. The ship, of course, was going ahead and run over the, uh, the, the area, so there was no, no hope of rescuing them. So yeah. that was the only accident that occurred for all the Max during the entire war. Just uh, two men killed and three airplanes lost. Well, I think this is further back in your talk. Uh, you were talking about uh, ships that had their own planes on them, not uh, an aircraft carrier. They take off from the ship and then they had to uh, go to land, find land in order to uh, come down. And that if uh, they, they, they were primarily used against the uh, Condors, I thought. Rockets. You didn't rockets. really mention who they were used against. The, the, the big advantage of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, R, R twin uh, wing airplanes, uh, the, the shooting down with the rockets, it occurred by almost by accident. When the uh, MAX were designed, Big difficulty was, you know, in fact, this was a, one of the arguments against doing the max. They're not going to be able to carry the normal load that the uh, the airplane carries. We used to carry a torpedo or a mine underneath, and that's what those airplanes were primarily for when they were originally designed. But yeah. they had four rockets under each wing. You could see them on this photograph before you. Just under the middle of the wings are four of each. Now, essentially, the aeroplane was quite light. It had more power once in the air than it normally had to use, only carrying these lightweight rockets instead of a torpedo, so that meant it could go up and reach the height of the Condor passenger aeroplane and go above it and come down and shoot it. And therefore, uh, shooting the Condor was the essence of that these airplanes made the major contribution to winning the Battle of the Atlantic. Yeah. A, a, a look of the draw in a way, but certainly valiant effort by the pilot and, and the co-pilot of these airplanes. But, I'm surprised they didn't try using dirigibles uh, uh, farther in, in the black hole. In the black hole, yeah. Yeah, um, because they did, uh, the U.S. Navy did use dirigibles around the cities where the convoys were leaving from. And there was even one instance where they were successful. Convoys, <laughs> the, sub. The, convoy, the convoys gathered. You've got to remember <laughs> that ships can't time themselves for loading cargo and one, let's say, coming up from Buenos Aires and the other one coming from New York to New Jersey, they had to collect. And yeah. they, it used to take them about two weeks to collect a convoy. So the convoy from New Jersey would set off while the convoy in New York Harbor was gathering. And that's, that's the case of all convoys. And that was the difficulty with coming round the Cape of Good Hope, collecting off the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, that uh, these are routine convoys. When you got specialized convoys, where you've got a troop ship or armor or something valuable to the fighting forces, then that's a, then that's a different convoy system altogether. There you'll have Royal Naval aircraft carriers and superb armament, as such as when we went to rescue Malta at Operation Pedestal. The, the different convoys than the routine once every two weeks. And the other thing that happened was we didn't have a convoy going back because if you hung around the United Kingdom, 
you'd get bombed out of nowhere. So they used to have to go and set off. If there happened to be a Royal Naval frigate and you could persuade the captain instead of doing his normal 25 knots to come along with you at 12 knots, then he might come along and keep you a company. That was not much of the case most of the time. Okay. Yes, thank you. I mean, I, I, yeah, I too was intrigued by a photo, I guess it was earlier uh, on, uh, which showed a, a, a catapult um, uh, uh, plane leaving uh, by that means and uh, not, not being able to, to, to land back on the, on the, on, on, on the deck. Um, okay. <clears throat> Are there any further uh, questions? Uh, now's your chance. If anybody has uh, uh, anything they need to want to learn uh, about uh, convoys and the and, and the air gap and, uh, and and so on, now's your chance. I think there might be something that's been written. Um, there are two now. Uh, Jeremy Rudd, uh, you have a written question here. Um, and I'm happy to uh, read it out. Um, I've just allowed you to talk if you prefer to read it uh, or ask it yourself. Um, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a comment rather than a, a question. Um, no, it's, a, it's okay, I'm happy to talk. Um, yeah, just uh, maybe I can help out regarding the question about why, didn't, uh, why uh, did we use catapult ships rather than seaplanes? It's simply that the sea conditions in the North Atlantic are very, very different to, say, the South Pacific. Uh, yeah, the Americans, the Japanese, and the South Pacific use seaplanes. So do some of the German disguised raiders in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but if you think about sea conditions in the North Atlantic, it's very, very rare that you will be able to land, land or take off with a seaplane. And in fact, one of the earliest catapult ships, uh, slightly predating the, uh, the merchant catapult ships, was uh, HMS Pegasus. Uh, flying, uh, flying naval former fighters, and that in fact was converted from a seaplane carrier. Had been a seaplane carrier, but they converted it to a, cat uh, to a catapult ship. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully that answers the uh, gentleman's question. Right, excellent. Okay. Something else I'd just add to you about an earlier question. You have to remember, of course, that the United States came into the war primarily because what happened from the Japanese attack. Uh, in the Pacific, and the concentration on effort had to be out there rapidly. Now, America, of course, is a, a boom nation. Once they decide to do something, and boy, do they get on with it. So they did provide Europe with tremendous amount of stuff. However, they had to concentrate on the Pacific initially, rather than the Atlantic. So the Americans didn't operate convoy systems guarded by American ships. Their ships were used for fighting forces rather than just protective units. And then, no blame culture on that. The Americans took a pounding in uh, the Japanese Sea and if they hadn't have taken over, then there was some, a lot of difficulty. I think the seaplanes on the American ships though were kind of an out of date, uh, feature because uh, usually the larger ships had access to carriers in their groups. And so uh, the average uh, American uh, capital ship didn't need a seaplane any longer for scouting purposes. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not too sure about the seaplane. That, uh, the, the Mark ships didn't have a seaplane. They, uh, they had normally uh, normal landing planes. The, uh, the flying boats that we refer to, the Sunderland and the uh, Catalina, uh, they didn't go out into the Atlantic and land in the Atlantic. They did their job there and they had sufficient uh, range to be able to get back to reasonably calm waters to land. But obviously, you can't land an aeroplane, a sea, a sea aeroplane, in rough seas of any kind. Okay, um, shall we? Shall we move on? Thanks uh, for, for that. Um, there's a question from uh, Ian Stafford, but before before that, there's a comment from uh, Ian uh, Lister, 
um, who I'm going to allow to talk. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, Ian, to your, your comment about convoys and 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 um, and ending that, or I'm happy to read it out. Now you're muted. I, I think if you read it out, please. Okay. All right. So, so the, the, the point is this, that, that the convoys were sometimes not alerted to the presence of U-boats, right? Because that would reveal that the Enigma code had been broken. This is the, this is the comment. So convoys were uh, uh, alerted and so could change course if a plane had actually sighted a U-boat or boats on the surface. When it was known through Enigma, uh, that a U-boat pack was was going to attack plane uh, were going to attack planes. We then sent out search for U-boats on the surface, but the pilots were not informed uh, that we already knew where the U-boats uh, were. So that's an interesting um, uh, observation. Right? Not wanting to to reveal uh, the success of of, of, of any multi-party. I don't know if you have a response to that, Roger. Well, that, that that's correct, of course. That. Mm -hmm. uh number of ships, merchant ships lost, uh, mainly from U-boat attack, uh, indicates that uh, the convoy system uh, wasn't perfect. That uh, mm. the, 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 if had the Germans continued its initial policy of allowing U-boats to roam free, it would have been even worse. Uh, there was no guarantee that the uh, swordfish air, airplanes on their convoy duty would uh, find the Condor and shoot it down. And no guarantee that once the information was passed that they could get out of the way of the attacking U-boat group. However, the fact of the matter is that none of the Max were attacked or sunk and they must have been prime observed targets from a U-boat conning tower, that uh, the fact that they weren't sunk would indicate that, generally speaking, they were successful. No attack was ever made on the Mac, and they all came through the war, apart from the accident I mentioned with three lost aeroplanes, no, no casualties at all. They all, including the Royal Navy ones, they all survived. So something must have gone Right, however, the fact of the matter is there was a large number of merchant ships sunk by U-boats during the war, and mm -hmm. uh, there's no denying that. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, maybe we can wrap it up by inviting uh, Ian Stafford to ask uh, one last uh, question. Just been waiting patiently, and we're now there, Ian. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, a bit of a, a, a detailed question, but um, presumably the uh, aircraft, uh, these well, uh, ships carrying the uh, the aircraft um, uh, were perhaps a, a, a prize to be sunk or um, attacked. So I was wondering wh how you arranged the convoy. Where 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 was the best place to put these? Um, um, carriers in relation to the uh, box of the convoy? In the, in the centre. Oh, oh, the, the, the carriers were always placed in the centre. They are obviously on the, on the, usually they were four or five rows of ships. The outer two were uh, frigates, usually, sometimes destroyers, but normally frigates from the Royal Navy. Then there would be three uh, rows of cargo ships, and the Commodore ship would always be the central ship, usually a slightly larger ship than the rest, semi-passenger cargo carrying, not carrying passengers, but uh, in times as people might carry, say, 20 passengers, as opposed to a normal uh, passenger liner. And uh, then the Mac uh, ships, had to have uh, space to maneuver because obviously when the aeroplanes had to take off, they, the ship had to point into the wind uh, and vice versa for landing. So that, that uh, gives you some idea. They were placed in the center because the center was the most difficult place for the U-boat to attack. 
you know, uh, the idea was if you're going to sink a ship, sink one on the outside. I know it's a bit hard to say, but that's the way things were thought about at the time. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I, you know, I wish uh, I'm doing this at work and I wish I had a glass of wine with which to toast you, Rodney, and with which, therefore, to uh, express our, our gratitude and our, and our thanks for that uh, very interesting uh, talk and that insight into a particular feature of the, uh, uh, of the convoys. Um, and uh, we, we, we can't do uh, a normal round of applause, but uh, if you would, just please uh, imagine our, our, our genuine uh, gratitude. Um, and um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you to everybody. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly, Merchant and Royal Navy today, they're doing a good job. Uh, trying very hard to do into uh, the green activity necessary for the future. Launch has two distinct meanings. As a noun, what? it means an act I or don't know what of launching something. I was going to say that, that was a wonderful uh, 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 moment to stop, and then we get to, uh, we get interrupted by some by some robot. But it remains uh, an excellent uh, uh, way to end. Uh, and so uh, I thank everybody, and thank you again, uh, Rodney. Very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good boy. Good.